Hey everybody, it's Mike here from The Art of Guitar. I cannot believe it's been 30 years since Kurt Cobain passed away. I do remember that time period quite well, and I wanted to talk a little bit about it and tell you what it was like when Nirvana suddenly took over the world back in the day. But let's go a little bit before that. I remember a specific concert that was kind of life-altering. It was called Clash of the Titans, and it was Megadeth with Anthrax, Slayer, and Alice in Chains. Now, Alice in Chains came out, and I knew Man in the Box, but that was about it. So they came out, and I believe they started with We Die Young, and it's real heavy. It was just killer. But they just didn't seem to fit the bill correctly. They were like an alternative band back then, especially compared to the metal bands that were about to follow them on stage. I just remember how the music just sounded a little bit different, and Lane Staley, I didn't know his name at the time, but he would hold the microphone, and he would shake his head kind of like he was saying no instead of headbanging. So all of us traditional metalheads, you know, we're trying to headbang, but he's up there with shorter hair doing the uh, back and forth no thing. Now, even though a lot of us didn't really know too much about the opening band, Alice in Chains, we all knew that they kicked total ass. You know, it's undeniable when you see them, even in their earliest clips, that they're just a solid tight band that was going to make it huge. But at the time, you know, they're still a bit of a mystery to us. You have to keep in mind that this was a night for metal. You know, now I look back, I call it like old school metal, but at the time, you know, all this stuff was new and exciting to me. So Megadeth, you know, had just come out with Rust in Peace. We had Anthrax coming out. Uh, Slayer came out, and I swear, it's like the skies changed, like the clouds rolled in. It, you know, someone described Black Sabbath one time like this, and I swear this happened when Slayer came out. Suddenly the mosh pit started to grow and just get scary. You know, the music started and I started to see people coming out of the mosh pit with bloody noses and they'd be directed to the medical tent. And that kept happening through their entire set. And of course, seeing Megadeth in their Rust in Peace lineup, one of the most legendary lineups ever for Megadeth, in my opinion, uh, it was just something else to see that back then. So I left that show remembering, of course, all my favorite thrash bands and heavy metal bands. But Alice in Chains still stuck in my head, and later on they would become one of my favorite bands of all time. I would watch MTV, I'd listen to the radio, back then we had 93X was our rock and metal station, and I recall there being a lot of metal ballads, like hard rock ballads. So you had bands like Winger with a song called Miles Away, which is actually a really, really great song. We also had Fly to the Angels, seemed to always be on the radio, as well as uh, She Talks to Angels, you know, it's one of those things where a lot of the songs about angels back then. But to go along with these ballads, we actually had some real intense awesome tunes like Shotgun Messiah came out uh, they were just a little late to the party I think if they would have come out two years earlier they would have been one of the biggest bands of all time but Shotgun Messiah came out with Heartbreak Boulevard and that's one of those songs I call it the swan song because it was one of the last real big rock hits that I remember happening before Nirvana hit at least on our airwaves here in Minnesota also, you know, Metallica's Black Album came out that year, and so you had Enter Sandman and Sad But True and Nothing Else Matters and The Unforgiven. All of that was being played on infinite repeat as well. This time in my life is seared into my brain because it's when my sister finally got her license, and she had this huge Buick boat of a car, and she would take us to, you know, like Subway to get lunch. And on the way there, we always blasted her radio, and that's the very first time I ever heard those first four legendary chords. I keep trying to imagine the look on my face the first time I heard the song Smells Like Teen Spirit because it was so different and so new to us at the time. Now you listen to it, and if you're younger, you grew up hearing it your whole life. You know, just like when I grew up, I heard ZZ Top and, you know, Ozzy Osbourne my whole life. But to hear Nirvana and to hear Kurt Cobain singing for the very first time, it was so different. I instantly loved Kurt Cobain's vocals. Uh, I just couldn't understand anything he was saying. I kind of felt like how my mom describes heavy metal sometimes. She'd be like, yeah, I just can't understand the words. But uh, for me, it was that way with Kurt Cobain. I was like, I'm getting like every fifth word I'm kind of understanding, but I'm not really sure what he's saying in the chorus. When the solo came for Smells Like Teen Spirit, I was very disappointed. And I thought, I can't believe this guy's just playing the vocal melody for the guitar solo. Here I am used to guys like Marty Friedman just shredding like crazy. <laughs> And then I hear this. Now this is pre-internet, so I had no idea what the band even looked like. I didn't even know their name actually, because the DJ didn't say their name at the beginning. The song just started. So it was just this big mystery of this weird new song that I heard. But I imagined it in my head like it was a five-piece band, and I pictured the singer looking like Mark Slaughter. I don't know why, just like a 
like a pale looking dude with dark hair, I thought. And this is a strange event, but I went to school not too long after that. And I saw a kid with a notebook sitting on his desk and on it was written Nirvana. And just something told me that that was special. That word was special for some reason. Like who writes Nirvana on their folder if it's not meaningful in some way? Well, a few days after that, I caught the video on MTV. So I caught it when it was halfway through. And as they were playing, I looked at the kick drum because that's usually where the band puts the name of their band. And it says Shaka for some reason. I was like, okay, so the band's called Shaka. That's kind of interesting, whatever. And then at the very end of the video, you know, the text comes up on the screen and it said Nirvana. And I'm like, oh, Oh, and I put two and two together. I'm like, the kid's folder, the song, it all makes sense now. There's some kind of weird Beatles wave happening right now. Something big is coming. But as I watched the video for Smells Like Teen Spirit, I was just so confused because in my head, I pictured that five-piece band with Mark Slaughter singing. But instead, there's this guy with short blonde hair wearing like different style of clothes than we ever saw around where I lived. And, uh, you know, they had the cheerleaders and it was just a very bizarre, surreal type video. And it was also crazy to me to see that the band was only a three-piece band and they were making that much sound so it's really cool to me when a band only has three members i know in the studio you could add extra tracks and everything like that but it just sounded like a huge band coming through the speakers it's only three people and then it just caught traction you know everybody started talking about this band nirvana and the radio station started playing come as you are in bloom lithium uh those kind of songs they just kept playing it on rotation so it's almost like we were being force fed and back then we only had a few stations to listen to so it's kind of like we were forced to listen to to Nirvana, and we all slowly started to like it collectively. And with every new Nirvana release, it almost felt like someone was stabbing the music scene that we knew of and was just twisting the knife with each release. And the thing we knew for so long was slowly bleeding to death until it was gone completely. The fashion at school started changing. I noticed people that used to wear hard rock t-shirts like Skid Row and Motley Crue and all that and Guns N' Roses were suddenly wearing the clothes that looked a lot like the Nirvana video. So this wave of fashion just kind of came and hit us. It's a lot like if you're younger, you may have remembered when Mumford and Sons got big and all of a sudden it's like overnight, everybody looked like a damn lumberjack or something. Not only were people changing the way they dressed, but they were changing their hairdos as well. So people that had long hair, they would cut it up to like their shoulders to have that Kurt Cobain sort of like straight across look. And the worst part was that a guy that I was kind of on bad terms with, I just didn't like him for stupid reasons. He was dating the girl of my dreams, but you know, when you're young and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of hated the guy. He ended up looking just like Kurt Cobain. So he did the haircut and his face already kind of resembled Kurt Cobain. So this is really childish, but I thought, you know, now I can't let Kurt Cobain. It's like the friend of my enemy is now my enemy. It's a stupid way to think, but it's a, a very human thing, it seems like. If somebody you just despise likes something, it's almost like you have to hate that thing too. So here I was torn because I actually really liked Nirvana's music. You know, I didn't love it because I was a metalhead and I was into Metallica and Megadeth and all that stuff. But, you know, I, I thought it was cool. You know, I was just like, all right, this is a cool kind of music. Maybe I could just integrate it into what I like, whatever. I don't have to fall completely into it like everyone else seems to be. But because I decided now I have to hate Kurt Cobain, it kept me at a distance from the band. So I was just kind of a passive fan. And I really can't downplay how collectively as us metal shred guitar players were in a group, we all decided we couldn't love Nirvana for a long period of time. We were like, who's this Kurt Cobain guy? He's more of a songwriter who strums chords. You know, that's kind of what we were talking like. We were like, he's over there just playing melodies on his guitar. And I want to hear, you know, tremolo picking and fast tapping and all this crazy stuff. But, uh, you know, he forced us to look at music in a different way. And you can't deny that all of a sudden people were focusing a lot more on songwriting than being flashy. Of course, after that, there was just the rest of the wave came. We had Pearl Jam, we had Soundgarden, we had all this Seattle music hitting us at once. And, uh, you know, every new release that came out, it was kind of exciting. So I'm like, how far can this really go? So the grunge alternative era was in full swing. That 93X station that I first heard Smells Like Teen Spirit on, they changed practically overnight. All of a sudden, I turned it on and they were playing REMs. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world. And they played it, I believe, for like a day or two straight. So as soon as the song got done, it would start right back up again. 
And that was strange because there was just like this talk between everybody, like, what's going on? You know, that's so weird. That is, is something going on at the station. It's just looping the same song over and over again. But when it came back, it had changed its name to 93.7 The Edge. And now they were playing mostly alternative and grunge music. They would go back and play old alternative from the 80s, which was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, it was just a different thing. Now we had nowhere to go for our heavy metal except for indie stations that barely dialed in. It was like half static. So if you wanted to hear something real heavy, uh, good luck. Well, my teenage metal band, thrash metal band, we were not deterred at first. We were still full steam ahead. We wanted to be, you know, the next Metallica. So we kept doing what we did, even though we felt the influences starting to creep in a little bit. But I recall one time we played somebody's birthday party in their basement. And this person was kind of in that alternative world, you know, and everybody there were wearing like baggy clothes and plaid and all that stuff. Well, there was two bands that night. The band that opened for us fit the bill perfectly. They were kind of an alternative type band and everybody loved them. They were really good too. Then we come up to play and we're playing headbanging type, you know, thrash metal. And it just felt like oil and water. It was a really strange concert because I'm sitting here playing, you know, heavy riffs. And usually I'm used to looking up and seeing people headbanging and stuff. Instead, these kids were kind of like standing around like, what do we do to this weird music? And that's when it hit me that everything had reversed. And suddenly we were the Alice in Chains of this concert. You know, back when Alice in Chains was alternative, they stuck out. And they weren't really fitting in. And now, because we stuck to our guns and we were thrash metal in an alternative scene, now we were like the Alice in Chains. The only difference, though, is we never got huge. <laughs> Besides not allowing myself to like Kurt Cobain, I really started to take in the grunge movement and the alternative movement and really started to love these bands. I mean, how undeniable is Soundgarden, you know? And I already liked Alice in Chains, you know, from before. But then Smashing Pumpkins, you know, just all this really great guitar-based music was getting huge. And even though the kind of music I loved was being pushed aside, you know, even the hair metal stuff, I was missing that as well. Uh, there was still guitar-based music that took its place, at least. Now, you have to realize how short of a period of time this is now. So late 91, uh, Nevermind came out and Nirvana basically took over. Then in the next couple years, this is really crazy to think about, they record In Utero, which is their next release. And they actually recorded that here in my home state. Uh, they were in Cannon Falls, I believe, Pachyderm Studios. So that was a big deal around here to know that they were here recording. They released the album in late 93. And then in early 1994, Kurt Cobain is found dead. That's how fast all this stuff happened. Within that three-year span... Nirvana came out of nowhere, seemingly to us, and changed everything, changed the world, kind of like the Beatles did. And then Kurt Cobain's dead, and that's the end of that. That was a weird day in school, the day we all heard the news. Uh, just people were hanging up signs in the hallway in memory of Kurt Cobain, and everybody just seemed really somber. You know, even like teachers, people that didn't really listen to Nirvana, they still felt the impact of that. Uh, like I keep saying, we didn't have too much for choices back then. So it's not like we all knew a thousand bands. You know, there's only a handful of huge bands at the time. And so when somebody like that passes away, it's kind of a blow to everybody. That day and for about a year afterwards, I felt extremely guilty for keeping Kurt Cobain like at an arm's distance just because I hated this guy for stupid reasons. And I really owe a lot to Kurt Cobain, you know, like even after he passed away, a ton of my students wanted to learn Nirvana songs on guitar. And a lot of us teachers kind of didn't like that at first. We're so used to teaching ACDC and Metallica. Now we're learning all these alternative, you know, uh, guitar parts from these grunge bands. And it was kind of weird feeling and we didn't like it at first. But after all that, we look back and it's actually a really good memory, at least for me, because we actually Actually were teaching music that had guitar, major guitar parts in it. In time, you know, auto-tune took over. Students would bring in mumble rap songs or soundtracks and say, I want to learn how to play this on guitar when there's really no guitar in any of the music they're bringing in. So it made me look back on the Nirvana influence days as like a really good nostalgic memory now. And I guess this video is kind of to repent for, you know, my attitude towards Kurt Cobain at the time. Uh, you know, this plus the videos that I have put out in the past on my channel, one of them being one of my biggest videos, actually. It's the seven levels of Smells Like Teen Spirit. It's about 4 million views now. So I feel like I'm trying to honor Kurt Cobain any way I possibly can just to make up for that early time when I was being stupid. I think he used the quote, it's better to burn out than to fade away. 
And that's the crazy part is they did burn out fast, you know, obviously after he passed away, but they never faded away. So I guess he got his wish. And I should probably take the time to apologize to Chris. That's the guy that I hated back in the day uh, for dating the girl of my dreams. Because who knows if I maybe would have dated her. That's all I would have done was just hang out with her. And I probably wouldn't have played guitar as much. And I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. Who knows? (laughs) That's how I justify things in my head. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. It was a lot of fun. I love going down memory lane, as you know. Now we'll catch you at the next video. Thank you. Bye-bye.